Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. Good morning. It's now after 11, so you're wide awake, right? I really commended the early crowd this morning, impressed that uh, they were here as early, and then I told them they should be impressed. I got up at 5.30 this morning so I could be here for 8 o'clock, and, uh, but you're not impressed because you're the late crowd, right? <clears throat> It's uh, good to be here with you once again on this uh, Lord's Day, and special welcome to uh, all of you as well as our online uh, friends and participants. It's uh, been good to be with you these last uh, occasions and uh, getting to know you a little bit better. It's uh, hard to believe that uh, this time yesterday I was actually with a group of guys motorcycling in the the Waterton National Park. But um, weather's coming, good weather's coming again, Lord willing, and uh, so we'll have more opportunities. But when you live in this part of the country, uh, you take every opportunity you can uh, to ride a motorcycle. I know some of you here are into that uh, world as well. Well, let's begin uh, this morning with, um, uh, with a scripture from Mark chapter 12. This is where we want to focus our attention today. Uh, I have been following online with uh, the series that you've been working through, Loving God and Loving Others. <clears throat> And uh, Pastor Mike last week wrapped up the Loving uh, God piece uh, really, really fabulously. And uh, it's great to be able to connect with you and uh, over these miles, uh, kilometers I guess it is, uh, across the distance uh, with our technology. Uh, And so today I want to build a bit of a bridge or a transition between loving God and loving others, which is where you're going to be going for the next few weeks. The text is Mark chapter 12, and I felt... A couple of weeks ago, the Holy Spirit really leading me clearly to this passage because it provides a bridge between those two concepts. And in fact, um, I think that we could perhaps, uh, this is known as the great commandment, Um, I want to suggest that perhaps this is the impossible commandment. And you will discover that as we proceed this morning and as you listen to the text. And so we begin, uh, so seven verses, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. I invite you to follow along on your device, on your, uh, in your Bible, as well as those who are with us online. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher. The man replied, you were right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is God's word. This has been called the greatest commandment. It's contained in the three Gospels, uh, Matthew chapter 22, uh, Luke chapter 10, around the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, which is in response to the second part of the command, and here in Luke chapter 12. These three Gospel accounts, each with a slightly different nuance as the Gospel writer uh, wants the reader to hear and to understand. There's clearly two parts to the great commandment. The first part is to love God with all your being, with everything you have. To love God with your entire being. The other is to love others as you love yourself. Humanly speaking, both of these commands are impossible. We cannot love God the way we should all the time with all of our our soul, strength, and mind. Nor can we always love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. We love ourselves. That's a given. Can't change that. It's human nature. 
But we can't always love people. We can approach, we can get close. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we can get close, but we can never fully achieve it to God's high standard of expectation. Let's look at the setting for this conversation that Jesus has. What's happened is there's a crowd gathered around him. A crowd of people, as often was the case, Jesus had become a well-known teacher, a rabbi. Uh, I've been watching with uh, some of my family members recently, uh, The Chosen. It's a fabulous series. really brings the story of Christ uh, to life in, in, a, in, a, in a visual way. Uh, but Jesus is often surrounded by people who are, uh, who are um, interested in his teaching and very curious. And that's what happened on this occasion. It's contained in the earlier part of this chapter. Uh, the Sadducees, who did not believe in miracles, did not believe in the resurrection, uh, they had uh, asked Jesus a question. And it was a question based upon their faulty theology. There was no resurrection. And they were talking about resurrection and marriage in the life yet to come, in the kingdom. And of course, they didn't believe in resurrection, so they're trying to trick Jesus, and you can read about that in the earlier verses. They're gathered around in this uh, probably stand-up setting, uh, and in the context, there is a scribe who was listening into the conversation. The scribe was probably a Pharisee. Pharisees were different than the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in miracles, believed in a resurrection and a future. And so they're listening. This scribe is listening to the interaction between the Sadducees and Jesus. He was a teacher of the law, we are told in verse 28. Teacher of the law or a scribe was highly, highly educated. Uh, these were the biblical scholars of the day. They were the theologians of the day. And uh, seldom would someone want to debate or have, um, have a challenging conversation with them. Um, the scribe, however, is impressed by Jesus' uh, teaching and his understanding. Uh, he's standing there listening, and he may disagree with the Sadducees in their theology, uh, who do not believe in a resurrection. The, set, the Pharisee or the scribe would, would have a difference of opinion on that. However, they share the doctrine of pious human achievement. They both shared the idea that it was important for us to follow certain practices and rituals and behaviors and sacrifices and holy days and feasts in order to be accepted into the kingdom of God. And in the context of this, the scribe blurts out a question. He can't hold himself back. He wants to ask the question, and it's this. Um, it we'll come in verse 28. He asks the question. Jesus replies, gives an answer. The scribe, how did I do it? I guess I had, did I have Jesus over here? So the scribe asks a question of Jesus. Jesus gives a reply. The scribe responds to Jesus' reply, and then Jesus makes a conclusion. It's only a four-part interaction or four-piece, four pieces of the dialogue. Now, whether this is all there was or whether this is an abbreviated version, uh, we don't know. I expect it's probably the latter, and Jesus had more to say. But uh, each of the gospel writers have contained, have, have summarized for us the, uh, the interaction and the essence of it. The scribe's question then is in verse 28. It's a real question, and it's an honest question. And the question is this. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, this was common among scribes and, uh, of, of Jesus' day and for many generations before uh, to try and summarize the whole teaching of the law in one statement. Uh, the story is told of Hillel. Hillel was a well-known uh, biblical scholar uh, who lived to about 100 years of age, died about 20 years before this conversation took place. So there was still living memory of Hillel. And Hillel was asked by a Gentile once uh, about this, this very question. The Gentile said to him, if you can answer the question or give me the summary of the law while I stand on one leg, one foot, he says, I will convert and I will believe. And uh, Hillel, a very wise uh, um, biblical scholar, summarized it this way. He says, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow human being. It's kind of a version of the, of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. My point in telling you that story is that this was a common question that the scribes would have. And that is asked of Jesus, tell us, what is the greatest commandment? Give us, give us a summary of it. And so this scribe, unknowingly is standing nose to nose, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart with eternity. And he will not be disappointed. Jesus answers the question. He answers it in these two parts. 
and we know them well. Part one, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Part two, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Part one is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is a well-known passage. All Jews in Jesus' day would have known this. Uh, This is the opening and closing of every public service. uh, Shema Yisrael. In other words, it's, which means here. The word Shema in Hebrew is hear or listen. Actually, interesting, it's the same word, to hear or to listen. Shema, Shema Yisrael. He, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Pious Jews would recite this Shema passage every morning and every evening when they go to bed and when they get up. This was the creed of Israel, and it called for total, absolute, full dedication and devotion to God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Part two was known to at least the pious Jews because Jesus is quoting from a passage of Scripture, a verse of Scripture, hidden way back in Deuteronomy chapter 19. And if in your Bible you check Deuteronomy 19, it probably calls sundry laws. It's kind of a heading often used. These are a whole bunch of kind of uh, extraneous or or miscellaneous laws. And in verse 18, the, the law is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus pulls that very unfamiliar passage into answering the question, along with the very familiar of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The scribe is stunned by the answer. This is profound. Never before, never had any rabbi focused on these two verses or tied these two verses together, let alone in response to the question, uh, what is the greatest commandment? It's a brilliant answer. And um, I want to give you three reasons why the answer is brilliant. And um, they're not on the screen. Uh, they are in your notes if you're f- following the fill-in uh, portion of, our, uh, of your notes uh, with the bulletin. Um, but here they are. Number one, first reason it's a brilliant answer is Jesus uses these two verses to summarize the Ten Commandments. Summarizes the blank in your sheet. Jesus uses these two verses, Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19, to summarize the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue found in in, uh, Exodus chapter 20. The most important verses are the, uh, most important commandments, excuse me, are the beginning commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And Jesus is summarizing those with Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God. Rather than being the negatives of the Ten Commandments, this is a positive affirmation statement to love the Lord your God with everything you've got with full devotion. And the second most important, or the second group of commands, uh, begin with um, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not take another man's wife or another woman's husband, do not, um, do not, uh, what's the next one, do not steal, Uh, do not uh, lie, do not bear false witness, do not covet. And so Jesus is summarizing that latter half with that verse from Leviticus chapter 19, shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Never before had these two scriptures been joined. And so for the last 2,000 years since Jesus offered this summary of the law, this has become what we know as the greatest commandment. And I want to assert to you this morning that this is the impossible commandment. Humanly speaking, it is impossible for us to live up to this high and lofty standard that those two verses and Jesus has in mind. The second reason this is a brilliant answer is that loving God and loving others must go together. It's like two sides of the same coin. We can't love others without loving God. We can't love God without loving others. John put it this way. He said in 1 John chapter 4, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. 1 John chapter 4, it's towards the end of the chapter. The whole chapter is dealing with God's love and our love for him and devotion to him and to other people. Loving God and loving others uh, must go together. God who created us in his image and in his likeness deserves our worship and our adoration, our devotion. And likewise, people who have been created in his image and likeness deserve our love and affirmation and acceptance. 
It's a brilliant answer. Three, third reason why it's a brilliant answer is this is a convicting statement of a radical kind of love. Love God with everything you have, holding nothing back. Love others as much as you love yourself. I wish we had time this morning to get into the nuances of that. We don't have any problem loving ourselves. We love ourselves plenty enough. Um, and uh, that's understood in the Scripture. Jesus understood that. The, uh, Moses in Leviticus 19 understood that. But we are to love others. Use that standard of self-love in terms of, stand, in terms of our love for other people. If we're honest with ourselves, as I've said, we cannot. We cannot achieve this, not even come close. So the scribe asks a question. Jesus gives a thorough answer to the question by quoting two verses, and then the scribe replies. Remember, the crowd is still there. They're still listening in. And the scribe says to Jesus, after the stunning answer, he says, well said, teacher. Or as one commentator who is well-versed in Mark's gospel has said, um, has quoted this as saying, beautifully said, Rabbi. This is magnificent. Uh, Verse 33, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, the scribe has some spiritual insight here. He has some understanding that many of his peers did not. He could have put it another way to say, to love God and to love others fully is more valuable than to uphold the sacrificial system that I observe. To love God and to love your neighbor is more important than going down to Jerusalem on the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to offer the sacrifices and honor the holy days and the feasts and so forth, all the commandments of the the law of the Old Testament. To obey is better than sacrifice, as Samuel said. The scribe has a measure of understanding, of spiritual insight, and Jesus is likewise amazed. The scribe is amazed at Jesus' answer, and Jesus is amazed at the scribe's insight. And so he concludes, Jesus concludes in verse 34. He loved the reply. He was amazed at the reply of this scribe. And he answered him, because he saw how wisely he had answered, and he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And the reason he says that is because the scribe has insight. He is reflecting on the words of Samuel. Uh, way back in the uh, early book of uh, 1 Samuel, uh, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying, Samuel asks. And he answers, to obey is better than sacrifice. God's looking for obedience before he's looking for the sacrificial offerings. And so Jesus responds with these words in verse 34. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Now when I was studying this the past week or two, it stunned me to hear Jesus say this. You are not far from the kingdom. You're almost there. You're on your way. You need to take a few more steps and you will get there is the implication. You're near, but not quite. Jesus' response to the scribe is both a compliment and a warning. The compliment is, you're a wise man. You get it. You understand. You've been reading Samuel. You know the Old Testament. But it's also a warning. You're not quite there. You're not quite crossed the line. You're not yet in the kingdom. And so my question to us this morning is, what does this say to us? What are the implications of this to us? Can I suggest to you, humbly, that some of you here and online are very close? You're close to crossing the line, you're close to trusting Christ, but you've not yet done it. You may think you have, but you've not yet invited him into your life as Savior and Lord. Many of you are in the kingdom, and I'm not 
wanting to cause doubt in your mind. You are in the kingdom. You know you trusted Christ. You know that you're trusting his merits, not in your own goodness and in your own, uh, your own good works. The kingdom of God is not earned by attempting to keep the commandments, the great commandment or the ten commandments or any of the scriptural laws. We're past that. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. What does mercy mean? It means that God does not treat us as we deserve to be treated. Um, When I was, I'm a fairly aggressive driver. I've got a little extra time, I think, because it's the third service, right? But I will be careful to honor your time. I was driving back a few years ago with my parents at the time, and I was stopped by a, a police officer. I think it was good my parents were with me because he did not give me a ticket. I told my mom, don't say anything. I'll deal with this. And um, the police officer had, it was a snowy day, and I was driving over the speed limit, and, um, and he did not give me a ticket. Now, that's mercy, I deserved a ticket. I deserved it. Uh, a pretty hefty fine, to be honest with you. Three of my, one of my sons and two sons are police officers, so I, I, they are now at least. Um, I understand the, uh, the sense of, um, of freedom that officers have. He operated, he treated me with, with mercy. I deserved a ticket, and he did not give it to me. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's entirely a work of his. It's by grace. For by grace are you saved. Not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. Titus or Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Friends, it's the cross work of Christ that regenerates us. It is his place, it's his atoning death on this cross at Calvary that provides our salvation. His substitutionary death in our place, which we celebrated just two weeks ago at Easter, that's what gets us, that's our ticket into the kingdom. It's not our works, it's not the keeping of the commands, it's our our commitment to Christ. I love that verse in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 because it, verse 10 goes on to say that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So we've been born again. We're born again by faith through grace, but by grace through faith in Christ. But we are, um, we are born again to do good works, to love God, to love our neighbor. But those activities will never get us across the line. Let me conclude this morning with some lessons, five lessons uh, for us that, um, that we can apply to our own lives and circumstances and to our own church. Lesson number one is that it is possible to grow up in this church, to have godly parents, to be part of the programs of this church, and never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For those of you who have grown up here, uh, young adults, high school kids, children, uh, you need to meet Christ yourself. You need to make Christ Savior of your life. You cannot get into the kingdom on the coattails of your parents. Or because you attend this church which preaches the gospel, you need to meet Christ. And that's my desire for you. That's your pastor's desire for you, that you meet Christ face-to-face, person-to-person, one-to-one, not riding on somebody else's merits. Parents, your role, our role as parents is vital in this. We have an awesome privilege and responsibility. We have a responsibility to be, to be consistent in what we say and how we live. If there's any hypocrisy at all in our lives, our kids will see it. They live with us 24 hours a day. They can see it. They'll pick it up. Parents, your kids need to hear your story. They need to hear how you came to faith in Christ, what your journey was, and they need to understand that they need to make a decision likewise. Uh, Friends, it's a sobering thought. It's possible. It is possible to grow up here, grow up in a Christian home, be exposed to all the right things, and never come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Related to that, second lesson and these, there's some overlap between each of these. But the second lesson is this. It's possible to be a student of the Scriptures, uh, to study theology, 
to attend a Bible college, a seminary, to read the right books, to read the Scripture from cover to cover, and never become a true Christian. It's possible. It's a sad reality, but it happens. I've seen it. About 15 years ago, a man, a sociologist in the U.S. named Christian Smith wrote a book. And in that book, he used a term that has become well-known in, in certain circles. And um, he did a survey of uh, North American uh, young people, uh, college, university uh, students, and discovered that their worldview could be described best as a moralistic, therapeutic deism. It's about being moral. Being in church is good therapy for the mind and the soul, and it's about a God, a deistic God. The deistic view of God is that God started the universe. He created the creator God who got it going as a clock was wound up, and then he departed. He vanished from the scene to let it run on its own. That's deism. And he said, this is the worldview of of the average North American teenager in this generation. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. The idea being that if there is a God, he is a creator. He created the world, got it started. He wants people to be good, to be nice, to be fair, to treat each other well. That uh, central goal of life is to be happy, to feel good about ourselves. That God does not need to be, uh, not need to be involved in our life unless we're in trouble, and then we want to invite God in, but Otherwise, God's not really that interested, nor are we, and that all good people go to heaven. That's what Christian Smith discovered the average North American teenager believes. And this is a spiritual kind of a, an expression, but it's a spiritual expression or belief without Christ. There is no Christ in this. So my point is it's possible to be swept up in that thinking. It's possible to be exposed to good, solid teaching, to be a student of the Scripture yourself, and to study theology and to read right the good books and never come to knowledge of Christ. Lesson number three, it's possible to have heard of the grace of Christ that's been preached all your life, as long as you've been here, and still be resting on your own merits, still be resting on your goodness, the things I've accomplished, the things I've achieved, let me share with you my final conversation with my wife, if I can. I will try hard to contain myself. This will be the third time around, so I hope that I can do that. My wife, as most of you know, passed away five years ago, just over five years ago, after a very short 10-month journey with cancer. <clears throat> she passed away at home, was, which was her desire and her wish, and I was honored to be able to help to realize that for her. Um, so while she was at home in our family room in a, in, a, in a hospital bed, my girls, three of them, often would come to visit and would and support. And um, they were always taking turns sleeping at her feet on a, on a mattress. And it was the last night before she slipped into a coma that she um, told the girls she... She told the girls to get dad. She had a few things she wanted to say. So we had a 20-minute conversation that was profound and a blessing. I recorded it. I mean, I wrote it down following. That's why I know what she said. It was, it was 20 minutes. We talked about her kids. We talked about my future, about her anticipated future in the kingdom. But one of the questions she asked me was this. How do I know that I'm going to make it? How do I know that I'm acceptable to Christ? And part of me was surprised at the question because she taught the Bible her whole life. But part of me was not surprised because that's a common question that people ask at the end of their lives. And so I reminded her of what she had taught and I had taught for decades earlier. That is, it's not a large amount of faith. It's just a little bit of faith in a big Savior. That's what gets us into the kingdom. It's not the amount of faith. It's faith in Christ who 
who is a great Savior. After that short conversation, I pronounced a benediction over her. And that was the last conversation we had. She slipped into a coma and passed away <clears throat> five days following that. My point in telling you that is that it is possible to have heard of the grace of Christ and still be trusting in our own merits and our own goodness and our own obedience without trusting in him. The fourth lesson, there's overlap here in each of these, but the fourth lesson is this. It's possible to, keep, to try to keep the Ten Commandments or to try to keep the Great Commandment and never make it into the kingdom of heaven. It's possible to do our best to be obedient, to be consistent, to be faithful, to be loving, and never make it into the kingdom of God. We have our own ways of trying to measure up. We try to measure ourselves against other people. Some of us have like three-story buildings, and some of us build five-story, and then we see others with 15, 20, 30, 40-story buildings. And we're trying in our own best efforts to try to build a larger edifice. It's been a while since any of us have flown, many of us have flown at least, uh, but um, you remember flying over a city at 30 or 40,000 feet? You look down, I love watching cities from above, but you don't see the contours. The, all the buildings look flat from 30,000 feet. My point is that each of us, as we try to build our lives, we look at other people and we're trying to build bigger and larger and more expansive. As far as God is concerned, all of our, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, like Isaiah says. It's possible to try to keep his commandments and not make it into the kingdom. The fifth lesson, final lesson, it's possible to become gospel-hardened Harden to the gospel and seal your own damnation within the local church. That's a scary thought, but it's true. Once again, remember flying, go to the airport, your flight is called, you walk along the jetway, and there is a line step over the jetway onto the plane. Usually it's a gap, an inch or two. You can see the ground, the ground crew working below. If you don't take a step across that line onto the plane, you're not going anywhere. There's a point in our lives where we need to cross that line. We need to say, Jesus, I need you. I trust you. I've been doing things on my own, my own effort. I've been trying to keep the commandments, trying to love people. But ultimately, I need to trust you first. It's possible to miss the kingdom by 18 inches. That's the distance between the heart and the head. To know all these things and yet never allow our heart to be obedient and trust in Christ. And so, friends, this morning, here in this gathering or at home, um, it may be that today is your day. As the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you, drawing you to himself, I invite you to pray a prayer. I'm going to lead you in a, in a sample prayer. Uh, and if you're already a believer, if you've already trusted Christ, you can say, thank you, thank you, Jesus, thank you for this. But for those of you who have not yet trusted Christ, I invite you to follow along. Pray this prayer uh, on your own quietly as I lead you. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, today I ask you to come into my life. I realize that I've been trusting myself. I've tried to keep your commandments. I've tried to be good and to go to church. I've been religious, but I'm not a follower of Christ. Today, the lights have come on for me, and I repent of my self-righteousness. I confess my sin to you. 
please forgive me, Lord. I trust in your mercy and grace. I invite you to be my Savior. I choose to follow you as Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ian, for that. And let me bless you and uh, read a passage of Scripture for you in the benediction. It's from the book of Ephesians. And it says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. And your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long, how high, how deep his love is. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully, and then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that come from God. Lord, bless you richly. Have a wonderful week.